Marmion by Sir Walter Scott. Introduction to Canto First to William Stuart Rose, Esquire. Ashdiel, Ettrick Forest. November's sky is chill and drear. November's leaf is red and sear. Late, gazing down the sleepy lynn that hems our little garden in, low in its dark and narrow glen, you scarce the rivulet might ken. So thick the tangled greenwood grew, so feeble trilled the streamlet through. Now murmuring hoarse, and frequent seen through brush and briar, no longer green. An angry brook, it sweeps the glade, brawls over rock and wild cascade, and foaming brown with double speed, hurries its waters to the tweed. No longer autumn's glowing red upon our forest hills is shed. No more, beneath the evening beam, fair tweed reflects their purple gleam. Away hath passed the heather bell that blooms so rich on need path fell. Sallow his brow and russet bare are now the sister heights of year. The sheep before the pinching heaven to sheltered dale and down are driven, where yet some faded herbage pines. And yet a watery sunbeam shines. In meek despondency they eye the withered sward and wintry sky, and far beneath their summer hill stray sadly by Glen Kinnon's rill. The shepherd shifts his mantle's fold and wraps him closer from the cold. His dogs no merry circles wheel, but shivering follow at his heel. A cowering glance they often cast as deeper moans the gathering blast. My imps, though hardy, bold, and wild, as best befits the mountain child, feel the sad influence of the hour, and wail the daisy's vanished flower. Their summer gambols tell and mourn, and anxious ask, will spring return, and birds and lambs again be gay, and blossoms clothe the hawthorn spray? Yes, prattlers, yes, the daisy flower again shall paint your summer bower, Again the hawthorn shall supply the garlands you delight to tie. The lambs upon the lee shall bound, the wild birds carol to the round. And while you frolic, light as they, too short shall seem the summer day. To mute and to material things, new life resolving summer brings. The genial call dead nature hears, and in her glory reappears. But, oh, my country's wintry state, what second spring shall renovate? What powerful call shall bid arise the buried wide like and the wise? The mind that fought for Britain's weal, the hand that grasped the victor's steel? The vernal sun new life bestows even on the meanest flower that blows. But vainly, vainly may he shine where glory weeps or Nelson's shrine, and vainly pierce the solemn gloom that shrouds, O pit, thy hallowed tomb. Deep graved in every British heart, O oh, never let those names depart. Say to your sons, Lo, hear his grave, who victor died in Gadite wave. To him, as to the burning leaven, short, bright, resistless course was given. Where e'er his country's foes were found, was heard the fated thunder sound till burst the bolt on yonder shore, rolled, blazed, destroyed, and was no more. Nor mourn ye less his perished worth, who bade the conqueror go forth, and launched that thunderbolt of war on Egypt, Hafnia, Trafalgar, who, born to guide such high emprise, for Britain's weal was early wise. Alas, to whom the Almighty gave for Britain's sins an early grave. His worth, who, in his mightiest hour, a bauble held the pride of power, spurned at the sordid lust of pelf, and served his Albion for herself. Who, when the frantic crowd amain strained at subjection's bursting rain, or their wild mood full conquest gained, the pride he would not crush restrained, showed their fierce zeal a worthier cause, and brought the freeman's arm to aid the freeman's laws. Hast thou but lived, though stripped of power, a watchman on the lonely tower, thy thrilling trump had roused the land when fraud or danger were at hand. By thee, as by thy beacon light, our pilots had kept course aright. As some proud calm, though alone, thy strength had propped the tottering throne. 
Now is the stately column broke. The beacon light is quenched in smoke. The trumpet's silver sound is still. A warder silent on the hill. Oh, think how to his latest day, when death, just hovering, claimed his prey. With Polinure's unaltered mood, firm at his dangerous post he stood. Each call for needful rest repelled, with dying hand the rudder held. Till, in his fall, with fateful sway, the steerage of the realm gave way. Then while on Britain's thousand plains one unpolluted church remains, whose peaceful bells ne'er sent around the bloody toxin's maddening sound, but still upon the hallowed day, convoke the swains to praise and pray. While faith and civil peace are dear, grace this cold marble with a tear. He who preserved them, Pitt, lies here. Nor yet suppress the generous sigh, because his rival slumbers nigh, nor be thy requiet dumb, lest it be said o'er Fox's tomb, for talents mourn untimely lost, when best employed and wanted most, mourn genius high and lore profound, and wit that loved to play, not wound, and all the reasoning powers divine to penetrate, resolve, combine, and feelings keen and fancies glow, they sleep with him who sleeps below. And if thou mournst, they could not save from error him who owns this grave. Be every harsher thought suppressed, and sacred be the last long rest here, where the end of earthly things lays heroes, patriots, bards, and kings, where stiff the hand and still the tongue of those who fought and spoke and sung, here where the fretted isles prolong the distant notes of holy song. As if some angel spoke again, all peace on earth, good will to men. If ever from an English heart, oh, here let prejudice depart, and partial feeling cast aside, record that Fox, a Briton, died. When Europe crouched to France's yoke, and Austria bent, and Prussia broke, and the firm Russian's purpose brave was bartered by a timorous slave, even then, dishonor's peace he spurned, the sullied olive branch returned, stood for his country's glory fast, and nailed her colors to the mast. Heaven to reward his firmness gave a portion in this honored grave, and ne'er held marble in his trust of two such wondrous men, the dust. With more than mortal powers endowed, how high they soared above the crowd. Theirs was no common party race, jostling by dark intrigue for place. Like fabled gods, their mighty war shook realms and nations in its jar. Beneath each banner proud to stand, looked up the noblest of the land, till through the British world were known the names of Pitt and Fox alone. Spells of such force no wizard grave, ere framed in dark the Thalian cave. Though his could drain the ocean dry, and force the planets from the sky. These spells are spent, and spent with these, the wine of life is on the lees. Genius and taste and talent gone, forever tombed beneath the stone, where, taming thought to human pride, the mighty chiefs sleep side by side. Drop upon Fox's grave the tear, twill trickle to his rival's beer. Or pits the mournful requiem sound, and foxes shall the notes rebound. The solemn echo seems to cry, Here, let their discord with them die. Speak not for those a separate doom, whom fate made brothers in the tomb. But search the land of living men, where wilt thou find their like again? Rest, ardent spirits, till the cries of dying nature bid you rise. Not even your Britain's groans can pierce the leaden silence of your hearse. Then, oh, how impotent and vain this grateful tributary strain, though not unmarked from northern clime, ye heard the border minstrel's rhyme. His gothic harp was o'er you rung, the bard you dine to praise, your deathless names has sung. Stay yet, illusion, stay a while, my wildered fancy still beguile. 
from this high theme, how can I part ere half unloaded is my heart? For all the tears ere sorrow drew, and all the raptures fancy knew, and all the keener rush of blood that throbs through bard in bard-like mood, were here a tribute mean and low, though all their mingled streams could flow, woe, wonder, and sensation high, in one spring tide of ecstasy, it will not be, it may not last, the vision of enchantments past, like frostwork in the morning ray, the fancied fabric melts away, each gothic arch, memorial stone, and long dim lofty aisle are gone, and lingering last deception dear, the choir's high sounds die on my ear. Now slow return the lonely down, the silent pastures bleak and brown, the farm begirt with copsewood wild, the gambols of each frolic child, mixing their shrill cries with the tone of Tweed's dark waters rushing on. Prompt on unequal tasks to run, thus nature's disciplines her son. Meet her, she says, for me to stray and waste the solitary day in plucking from yon fen the reed and watch it floating down the tweed or idly list the shrilling lay with which the milkmaid cheers her way marking its cadence rise and fall as from the field beneath her pail she trips it down the uneven dale meet her for me by yonder cairn the ancient shepherd's tale to learn though off he stops in rustic fear lest his old legends tire the ear of one who in his simple mind, may boast of book-learned taste refined. But thou, my friend, canst filthy tell, for few have read romance so well, how still the legendary lay or poet's bosom holds its sway, how on the ancient mystical strain time lays his palsied hand in vain, and how our hearts at doughty deeds by warriors wrought in steely weeds still throb for fear and pity's sake, as when the champion of the lake enters Morgana's fated house, or in the chapel perilous, despising spells and demons' force, holds converse with the unburied corse, or when, Dame Ganor's grace to move, alas, that lawless was their love, he sought proud Tarquin in his den, and freed full sixty knights, or when, a sinful man, and unconfessed, he took the Sangreal's holy quest, and slumbering, saw the vision high, he might not view with waking eye. The mightiest chiefs of British song scorned not such legends for prolong. They gleam through Spencer's elfin dream, and mix in Milton's heavenly theme, and Dryden, in immortal strain, had raised the table round again. But that a ribald king and court bade him toil on to make them sport, demanded for their niggard pay, fit for their souls a looser lay, licentious satire, song, and play, the world defrauded of the high design, profaned the God-given strength, and marred the lofty line. Warned by such names, well may we then, through dwindled sons of little men, essay to break a feeble lance in the fair fields of old romance, or seek the moated castle's cell, where long through talisman and spell, while tyrants ruled and damsels wept, thy genius, chivalry, hath slept. There sound the harpings of the north, till he awake and sally forth, on venturous quest to prick again, in all his arms, with all his train, shield, lance, and brand, and plume, and scarf, fay, giant, dragon, squire, and dwarf, and wizard with his wand of might, and errant maid on palfrey white, around the genius weave their spells, pure love, who is scarce his passion tells, mystery, half veiled and half revealed, and honor with his spotless shield, attention with fixed eye and fear, that love the tale she shrinks to hear, and gentle courtesy and faith, unchanged by sufferings, time, or death, and valor lion-metalled lord, leaning upon his own good sword. Well has thy fair achievement shown, a worthy meed may thus be won. Yatin's oaks, 
beneath whose shade their theme the merry minstrels made of Ascapart and Bevis bold, and that red king who, while of old, through Boulderwood the chase he led, by his loved huntsman's arrow bled, attains woods have heard again, renews such legendary strain, for thou hast sung how he of Gaul, that Amadis so famed in hall, for Oriana, foiled in flight, the necromancers fell in might. And well in modern verse hast wove, Pertenopax's mystic love, hear then, attentive to my lay, a knightly tale of Albion's elder day.